for Paul Schaefer to give us a talk on randomness notions and reverse mathematics. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, uh, thanks so much for the organizers for inviting me. These are all been uh, very great talks and I hope this one is okay too. Um, so this is joint work with Andre Nice. Okay, so um, I'm not really assuming too much background about algorithmic randomness or reverse mathematics. So this might be a little bit slow for a lot of people, but hopefully, hopefully some people get some things out of it. Um, so the basic idea with algorithmic randomness is we're thinking of um, subsets of the naturals as infinite bit sequences. And we say that some set X is random relative to another set Z if Z cannot be used to describe, uh, predict, or compress the, the bits of X. Okay, and different formalizations of this idea yield different sorts of randomness notions. And what I want to do today is uh, explore these randomness notions as uh, set exist ax axioms of the form for every set Z, there's a set X that's random relative to X. Uh, sorry, that's, there's a set X that's random relative to Z, right, for various sorts of randomness. Okay. And uh, some things you might ask about this is, well, can random ax randomness axioms of this sort be used to prove any interesting classical mathematical theorems in the first place? And well, so they can, and we'll give a few examples of that. And then given that uh, these are uh, these randomness axioms are uh, useful for proving real theorems, uh, what I'll focus on a little more is how do these then randomness axioms relate uh, to each other. So my next slide here, I have sort of a schematic of the kind of thing I want to be interested in. So I've got a number of randomness notions listed here and don't worry about what precisely they mean for uh, now. This is just an example of the sort of thing I want to think of. Um, so two randomness notions are computable randomness and uh, Schnorr randomness. Okay, and the situation here is that, uh, well, every computably random set is Schnorr random, but not the other way around, right? Not every Schnorr random set is itself computably random. Uh, yet it so happens that every Schnorr random set can compute a computably random set. Okay, so if you're working in this uh, axiom system RCA0, which allows you to compute things from uh, existing sets and you have a Schnorr random set, then you also have a computable random, uh, computably random set, right? Because your Schnorr random can be used to uh, compute your computably random set. So even though these are different notions of randomness, right? Not every Schnorr random set is a computable random set. They are the same as random randomness axioms, right? If you assume that for every set Z, there's an X that's uh, Schnorr random relative to Z, then that's equivalent to assuming for every set Z, there's a computable uh, random X relative to, to uh, Z. Okay, so it could be the case that for sub pairs of randomness notions, for example, the computable randomness and the Schnorr randomness here, Right, even though they're different uh, notions of randomness, they um, yield the same axiom, or they have equivalent formulated as randomness axioms. They're equivalent over the system RCA not. Okay, so two uh, different notions of randomness could give rise to the same randomness axiom, right, or not. So at the bottom of the slide, I've got another example, right, with Martin-Luff randomness versus computable randomness. Right, again. Um, every Martin Luff random set is computably random, but not every computably random set is Martin Luff random. Okay, so if, again, we've got the situation where the one notion, Martin Luff randomness, is uh, stronger than the other notion, computable randomness. Um, but for this pair of randomness notions, it's now not the case that uh, from every computable random you could obtain a Martin Luff random. So as randomness axioms, if you have uh, Martin Luff randoms, you can get computable randoms. Right, just because every Martin Luff random is itself computably random, but you can't go the other way around. Uh, right, if you um, take uh, computable randomness as a randomness uh, axiom, then you cannot prove that a stronger randoms MLR exists. Right, then in fact, you, uh, um, if you look at uh, computable randomness as a randomness axiom, you can't produce uh, DNR, diagonally non recursive functions. 
Okay, so if you've got a pair of randomness notions, they might yield uh, the same randomness axiom or they might yield uh, different randomness axioms. Okay, and this is the sort of sort of thing I want to look at, right? How do, uh, how do notions of randomness thought of as set existence axioms compare to each other in this way? Okay. Right, so um, now uh, a little background on reverse mathematics. So formally we work in second order arithmetic, which means we, um, formally we have only natural numbers and sets of natural numbers, but through all sorts of coding, we can make sense of a lot of other things like trees, real numbers, the topology on the reals or other complete separable metric spaces, continuous functions and so on. All right, so really you can talk a, about a lot of things. Um, even though formally you just have natural numbers and sets of natural numbers. And the axiom systems uh, I'm gonna be interested in today on top of uh, what you get from these notions of randomness are the base system RCA not, which says that if you want some set, then you have to compute it from some existing set, All right? And also, we have a uh, restriction on how much induction we're allowed to use. Induction is restricted to sigma zero one properties. Okay, uh, next up in strength is a weak Kerning's lemma, where we assume RCA not plus uh, Kerning's lemma for binary branching trees. Right. And then stronger than that, we have the system ACA not, where um, you're allowed to form a set out of any uh, arithmetical formula, or rather every uh, if you have an arithmetical formula, you can form the set of a set of uh, natural numbers that satisfy that formula. Okay. Right. So now let me uh, um, dig a little deeper into the details of Martin Luff randomness. Okay. So this is um, maybe just a little bit also of uh, fixing notation. So if I have a finite uh, finite bit string uh, sigma, got bracket sigma denotes the open set. Um, coded by sigma, right? The open set consisting of all infinite bit sequences extending that uh, particular sigma, right? If I have a set U of such sigmas, I can think of that as a code for the corresponding open set, right? The open set obtained by unioning all of the open sets determined by those little sigmas. Uh, Martin Love test relative to some set Z is a uniformly Z RE sequence of sets of strings, thinking of them as coding uh, open sets, right? Such that for every n, the measure of the nth open set in my sequence is less than or equal to two to the minus n. Okay, and we think of Martin Luff tests relative to z as describing uh, effective null sets relative to z, and we say that some set x, right, some bit string sequence x passes the test if it's not in the intersection, right? If it's not in this null set. Okay, and then we say that a set x is Martin Luff random relative to z if, it, if the set x passes all of the ML tests relative to z. Okay, so, so this, uh, think of this as meaning that x doesn't have any um, unusual properties that, uh, that uh, z can describe, okay? X, X is not in a uh, null set that Z knows about. Okay, so this is a classic uh, Martin Luff randomness. And I guess the thing I want to point out about this is uh, so far all the things on this slide are readily formalizable in the system RCA not in a fairly straightforward way. Okay, so we can talk about uh, uniformly ZRE sequences, Martin Luff tests, whether or not the set passes a certain Martin Luff test and so forth uh, in a very straightforward way in a RCA not. Okay, so yes, this is what I was just saying. It's a straightforward to uh, um, phrase this property, some set X is Martin Luff random relative to some other set Z in second order arithmetic, or in particular um, using the concepts that the RCA not allows you. And then we can um, uh, let MLR also stand for the statement of, um, well, Martin Luff random sets exist as a randomness axiom. So I'm going to let MLR denote the statement. For every set Z, there is some set X where X is Martin Luff random relative to the Z. And as I was saying at the beginning, right, um, uh, you could ask yourself, can this uh, 
MLR statement be used to actually prove any interesting mathematical theorems that you've heard about before. Okay. So here's um, um, here's something uh, MLR can do. So let's remember a tree is a set of a uh, set of sequences that's closed under initial segments. Okay, and uh, well, we can talk about whether or not some some set is a path through the tree, or whether some binary sequence is a path through the tree, right? But we can't form the full class of paths, right? Because that's too big, because we're only working in second order arithmetic. But nevertheless, we can make sense of the idea that uh, even though we can't talk directly about this class of paths through the tree T, we can make sense of the idea that this class of paths should have positive measure, okay? So we can say that that's what I've written down here. We can make sense of the idea that the tree has positive measure sort of standing in for the idea that the class of paths through this T has positive measure, All right? And we'll say that's the case if there's some rational Q such that for every level N in the tree, the sort of proportion of possible strings in the tree at that level, which is to say the proportion of uh, strings of length N in your, in your tree, um, right over two to the end, right? The amount of all possible strings of length n is at least this uh, fixed rational Q. Okay, so if we uh, so if T has this property, we say that it has a positive measure, and then there's this uh, weak weak Kerning's lemma. So this is a, not a typo for people who've not seen this before, but the uh, weak weak Kerning's lemma is this. It's the even weaker form of weak Kerning's lemma. It's weak Kerning's lemma restricted to trees like this, trees of uh, with positive measure. Okay, so it's a uh, um, theorem essentially of Kuchera that this uh, Martin Luff randomness axiom, the MLR, is equivalent to this weak weak Kerning's lemma uh, statement. Okay, and this is a, in, in sort of more generality what uh, randomness, randomness, randomness axioms as set existence axioms are, are good for, right? You have some you have some sort of virtual set, right? In this situation, you have this uh, this closed subset of uh, Cantor space that you've sort of described as in a virtual way, right? You've coded it as the set of paths through this uh, through this tree, right? And you've somehow made sense of the idea that this class should have positive measure, okay? And then the then the MLR axiom tells you that yes, this set of positive measure does indeed have a point in it. Okay, so that's this is uh, what you can use uh, randomness sort of axioms to do, right? You have some, you have some, some virtual subset of some 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 measure space described in some way, right? And you've made sense of the idea that it should have positive measure, and now you want to conclude that there's a point in the set. Okay, and the sort of the uh, the more complicated your description is has to do with how strong of randomness axioms you need to conclude that there is indeed such a point. Okay, so so right, we have that uh, MLR as a set existence axiom is equivalent to this weak weak Kerning sum combinatorial principle, and um, and this is indeed strictly weaker than weak uh, Kerning sum. Okay, so so in terms of the usual reverse math uh, hierarchies, RCA naught plus MLR, this is uh, strictly between RCA naught and and weak Kerning sum. Okay, and all of this is uh, very well known for quite some time now, I'd say. Okay, so here's a, just a, a list of things um, that uh, that are equivalent to MLR over RCA naught. But I've got like six here, real uh, real mathematical theorems that are equivalent to to uh, to RCA naught, and not um, not so important for the rest of this talk what these say, but just that uh, yes, there are quite a number of examples of, um, of of real theorems whose axiomatic strength is. Um, described exactly by this uh, MLR. Okay, so, so yes, these uh, randomness axioms as set existence axioms really are useful for classifying the strength of, um, of re real theorems that you would see outside of logic. Okay. Right, so that's just one randomness notion so far. I want to uh, talk about a few others, and again, um, again, spell out the details because uh, the point I want to make is that um, so we looked at uh, Martin Luff randomness, and that was um, fairly straightforward to phrase in 
in second order arithmetic. Right now I'm going to talk about uh, week two randomness, which is again uh, straightforward to phrase in second order arithmetic. But then I'm going to talk about two randomness, and that's a little more delicate to, to set up correctly in, in second order arithmetic. So if you bear with me here, I've got um, week two week two randomness. So again, at the top of the screen here, I'm just recalling what a Martin Luff test is. And then uh, to get stronger to get stronger randomness notions, you allow more tests. Okay, you allow more tests, which capture more sets, and hence there are fewer randoms. So it's rarer to be random if there's more tests. Okay, so that gives you a stronger notion of randomness because it's, it's a little bit more unusual to find a random. Okay. So if, the, if there's more tests, then, then it's harder to pass all of the tests. Right, so a week two test is um, very similar to a Martin Luff test, right? It's again, it's a uniformly um, ZRE sequence of open sets, but instead of requiring that the measures of the components of the test go to zero at this fixed rate of the nth component being having measure less than or equal to two to the minus N, we just say that the limit of the measures is uh, zero. Okay, so this is a um, this is a stronger stronger notion of of uh, randomness, but again, it's sort of equally straightforward to phrase in uh, RCA not. Okay, just we change the condition on how fast the uh, measures of these sets have to go to zero. I should maybe say that uh, so the measures of these open sets, they're RCA RCA not could make sense of it being greater than or less than some particular number, but there might not be a real number in your model that is exactly the measure of the of the open set. Okay, but you can, but we don't need that. We just need to know that it's less than or equal to some some particular number, or that it goes to zero, and that's uh, and that's fine. Okay, so uh, week two randomness is the notion of randomness you get out of these uh, week two tests. So a set X is weekly two random relative to another set Z. If uh, X passes all the week two tests relative to Z, and I'll let the W2R denote um, week two randomness as a set existence axiom. So for all Z, there is an X such that X is weekly two random relative to, to Z. Okay, so that's so again, straightforward formalization of week two randomness in, in second order arithmetic. Okay. Uh, but then there's two randomness. Okay. So usually one, or at least I, when you think about two randomness, you think of it as Martin Luff randomness relative to the jump. Okay. So you'd say that X is two random relative to a set Z if it's Martin Luff random, uh, also called one random relative to the Turing jump of Z, okay? Which is, which is fine in ordinary math, but if you're uh, working over a weak theory such as RCA naught, this is a problem because the statement for every set Z, the Turing jump Z jump uh, Z prime exists, right? This statement is equivalent to uh, the system ACA naught, which is much stronger than anything uh, I want to consider here. Okay, so for two randomness to have some content, right? We need to be able to phrase this idea of X being two random relative to Z uh, without implying that Z jump itself exists. Okay, so that's what I've said here. I wanna say that X is two random relative to Z in a way that, that does not imply that uh, Z, Z jump is a set. Okay, and the way I wanna do this is to Look at the components of our tests as um, as a sigma zero two relative to z classes instead of well instead of Martin Luff tests relative to z jump right instead of uh, sigma zero one relative to z jump classes. Okay, so I want to so I want to phrase two randomness this way. Okay, so again we've got a tree uh, t. And just as we could make sense of the idea of the uh, measure of t being less than some rational, right? We can, or more than some rational, we can just as easily make sense of it, uh, measure of t being less than some rational, right? It's just the, uh, the dual idea, say that the measure of t is less than q if the forever, if there is an n such that the proportion of you, so that if you go up to level n in the tree, then the proportion of strings that could possibly be there is less than uh, this q. 
Okay. All right. So what I want to do then is code a sigma two class as a sequence of trees that are nested. Okay. And then the idea that is that my set to X is a member of this coded class if it's a path through one of these trees. Okay, so I'm thinking of the sequence of trees as a code for the class consisting of the union of the path through all of these, all of these trees. Okay, so that's what I'm saying down here, right? We say that X is a member of this uh, coded class W if, if, it's, if it's in, if it's a path through one of these trees, right, that comprise the code. All right, and then we can also make sense of the idea that the measure of this class is uh, uh, less less than or equal to some rational, right? Just by saying, well, the measure of the measure of the class is less than is less than Q if every tree in my code has a measure less than Q, right? And this this makes sense because I assume that the trees were all were all nested. Okay, so one one sigma two relative to z class is coded by a whole sequence of trees uh, uniformly computable from z. Okay, so now if I want a sequence of these uh, sigma two relative to z classes, right, to form a uh, to form what's going to be a two test, then I've got a uh, then I've got a double sequence of trees, right? One sequence of trees for each uh, class in my sequence of classes. Okay, so a two test relative to Z, so then a uniform sequence of sigma zero two relative to Z classes, where again, you have the same uh, measure condition from the, from the Martin Love class, uh, Martin Love tests. Okay, so the measure of the nth, um, nth class in my sequence has to be less than or equal to two to the minus N. Okay, so at the bottom of the page, I'm afraid I left off the, left off the N, but this should be W sub N measure of, measure of W sub class W sub N should be less than or equal to two to the minus N. Okay, so this is a two test relative to Z, coding it as a double sequence of, double sequence of trees computable from the Z. Okay, so I've got this uh, information repeated at the top of the slide here. And then as before, we say that some set X passes the test, right, if it's not in the, uh, if it's not in the intersection. Okay, and then finally we say that X is too random relative to Z if uh, X passes all of these uh, two tests relative to Z. And then we can define two randomness as a, um, as a set existence axiom in the same way that we have with, uh, with the other examples. We can say now that uh, two MLR is the statement for every set Z, there is some set X that is too random relative to Z. Okay, so now this took a little more effort, right, to formalize uh, two randomness in uh, in second order arithmetic than than one randomness and week two uh, week two randomness uh, did, right? So now we've got a, we've got a lot of sort of things floating around, right? We have this double sequence of trees, and we have to somehow make sense of all of their uh, all of their measures and uh, and so forth. Okay. Right, so uh, so this two randomness, I, just, I guess I just wanted to uh, um, have a slide here saying where some of these ideas came from. So two, two randomness in terms of uh, two tests was due to Kurtz. And then this equivalence of two randomness uh, as I've defined it here in terms of two tests and Martin Love randomness relative to zero jump is due to Kautz. And then a uh, number of people have considered uh, Two MLR as a set existence axiom in this uh, reverse mathematics, including Avogad, Dean, and Root, and Kanidis and Slayman. And uh, well, these were among the first, and then there's been many more since then. Um, and I'd also like to point out that uh, this two MLR does have uh, interesting, interesting consequences, interesting mathematical, mathematical consequences. Um, Neither of the, so I've got two examples here and uh, one being the rainbow Ramsey theorem uh, for pairs and the other being a particular version of the dominated convergence theorem, right? So not, neither of these are precise equivalences. So I've written here are consequences of two MLR. Um, so for the rainbow Ramsey theorem, this is a uh, provable from RCA not plus uh, two MLR but it's not equivalent, right? In fact, it's equivalent to something, uh, something weaker called 2DNR. OK. 
Okay. And, uh, and for, um, for the dominated convergence theorem, you, well, you do get an equivalence, but not over RCA naught. You need to add in this uh, V sigma two uh, bounding, bounding scheme. Okay, and just about this dominated convergence theorem, I just wanted to want to point out that this is the statement here that's equivalent to two randomness over RCA zero plus B sigma two is just sort of the, the convergence and measure part of the dominated convergence theorem. So here the assumption is that is that you have all of the data already, right? You have the sequence of functions Fn, you have the dominating function G, you have the, uh, the integrals of everything, and critically, you also have the function f that the fn's converge to pointwise. Okay, so you have all of the functions involved already, and then the conclusion is just that, uh, well, if these little these fn's converge to to f pointwise, then they also converge in terms of the in terms of measure, in terms of the integral. So this is just the just the convergence part of the dominated convergence theorem that's equivalent to um, equivalent to to MLR. All right, if you actually have to find the function f as well, then, then that's ACA naught. But if you have the function f, then that's two MLR to get the convergence in the end. Right, okay. All right, so there's interesting consequences of two MLR as well. Okay, so now I want to uh, think about how these three things that we've um, introduced so far compare to each other, right? We've got, uh, MLR, week two randomness, and two MLR. Um, so here we've got that uh, two MLR is strictly stronger than, than week two randomness. Okay. So two MLR proves if you have two random sets, then you can get week two random sets, right? In fact, every two random set is itself uh, week two random. Uh, but you can't go the other way around, right? RCA naught plus W2R won't give you two randoms, right? In fact, it won't give you even uh, uh, DNR functions relative to, to zero jump. Okay, so um, So you have to do a little something to prove this, right? If you want to, one of the nice things about these randomness axioms is that often it's the case to that it's easy to Produce a model of um, of of these randomness uh, randomness axioms. For example, with uh, MLR, right, if you just have MLR or two MLR for that matter, um, there's this famous theorem called Van Lambalgen's theorem, which says that if x join y is random, um, well x join y is random if and only if x itself is random and y is random relative to x. Okay, so this works for uh, plain MLR. To MLR, okay, and what this means is that well, if I want to build a model of uh, of MLR, say, then I take a set that's Martin Love random, and I slice it into columns, and basically I take uh, all of the sets that are computed by the first n columns for every n, and Val Van Lambalgen's theorem tells me that that straight away is a is a is a model. Okay, so if I want to build a model of uh, week two random, that's not that's not a model of uh, two of uh, two MLR. Then the impulse is to okay, well, let's start with a, a week two random. That's not uh, that's not too random, and do this Van Lambalgen's theorem. But that actually doesn't work because Van Lambalgen's theorem doesn't work for two ran uh, for week two randomness. Okay, so you have to do a little more um, to to set this up for this particular theorem. Okay, so Van Lambalgen's theorem doesn't hold for week two randomness, so you can't do the Van Lambalgen trick straight away. Okay, but you, but you, what you can do is use the fact that uh, the Van Lambalgen theorem works for for ML randomness, and you can combine that with the fact that uh, if you have a um, uh, if you have an X join Y that's uh, that's hyperimmune of hyperimmune free degree, and the Y is ML random relative to X, then Y is also weakly too random relative to uh, relative to X. Okay, so you can you can get the model you want basically by using Van Lambalgen's theorem, not for week two randomness, but for one randomness for Martin Love randomness plus this extra fact. Okay. All right, so that tells us that uh, two MLR is stronger than W two R as set existence axioms. 
Okay, so I've got now the uh, um, sort of picture of the things I've uh, mentioned already, right? Not with all the explanations of everything, but uh, here's how the, here's how these randomness uh, statements I've mentioned so far are related to each other, right? So everything is below ACA naught. Um, none of the randomness uh, assumptions are above weak kerning's lemma, right? So what I've got uh, week two, uh, we've got two randomness then week two randomness, and those are all above MLR. Weak kerning sum is also above MLR, right? Because remember that MLR is equivalent to the weak weak kerning lemma, which is a, clearly a restriction of weak kerning lemma. Then below that, we've got the computable randomness and Schnorr randomness, which are equivalent to each other. Um, and none of these things are provable in, in RCA naught. Okay, so that's the uh, picture of the things I've mentioned so far. Okay, and again, we know that there's a sort of interesting theorems here at this level, MLR, and also at this level, two MLR, or maybe two MLR plus uh, B sigma two. Um, don't know of any good examples yet of theorems that are, say, equivalent to weak two randomness or to computable or Schnorr randomness, but uh, maybe someday, maybe somebody else knows. Okay, so there's interesting questions also about the uh, first order strength of two MLR, which I am certainly not an expert in and don't know much about, but I want to mention them. Well, I want to mention them anyway. So exactly characterizing the first order consequences of RCA plus two MLR is still an open problem as far as I know. And um, sort of the, the way we measure first order strength is via these induction bounding and cardinality schemes. Um, so I've got the three most relevant ones here, right? I sigma one, that's the induction scheme for sigma zero one formulas. This is what comes built into RCA naught. Okay, so these, and I've listed them here in increasing, uh, decreasing strength, I guess. So this is the weakest one. Um, B sigma two, right? This is another popular one. This is the bounding scheme for sigma two uh, formulas. Right, you can also say that this is equivalent to the induction scheme, but now for delta two predicates. And then the C sigma two in between is a little bit more of an unusual one. And it says that uh, it's a scheme that says if you've got the sigma two, sigma two formula defining an injection, then the range is unbounded. And an injection on the natural numbers. Okay, so these are, um, Bench, these these and um, similar sort of statements are benchmarks by which uh, we judge first order first order strength. Okay, and what's known about this is that two MLR implies C sigma two at least. Okay, so you are uh, um, so the first order consequences are more than that of a RCA naught, which is just sort of described by I sigma one. Okay. Uh, RCA naught plus B sigma two plus two MLR is pi one one conservative over RCA naught plus B sigma two. Okay, so you're not gonna go beyond B sigma two. Okay, but on the other hand, two MLR does not, uh, does not prove B sigma two. Okay, so, so the first order consequences of uh, RCA naught plus two MLR, it's um, so strictly, strictly weaker than what B sigma two gives you. Right, strictly more than I sigma one, right? Because you have at least the C sigma two. Um, as far as I know, it could be exactly C sigma two. I'm not sure that's been ruled out. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's been more uh, recent work in this direction, uh, getting um, sort of more explicit uh, upper bounds, or upper bounds better than I guess B sigma two on on what the uh, what the first order consequences of two ML are. R. Okay. Right. So, what I want to talk. One of the things that um, Andre and I did were to uh, show that the characteriza characterization of two randomness in terms of um, uh, incompressibility can be done in um, can be done in RCA not. And I think this is a, a nice and potentially useful thing because uh, 
uh, well, when we were introducing the formalization of two randomness, right, it took a bit of work, right? There's a lot to say. Um, yeah, again, you have these uh, coded sigma two uh, classes with the double sequences of trees, right? And it's a lot of it's a lot of work to set it up in 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 second order arithmetic, and therefore it's a bit cumbersome to work with. Okay, whereas you can talk about uh, plain Kolmogorov complexity um, very easily. So this gives once we have the equivalence, right now, then we have a much cleaner formalization of two randomness for use in uh, in second order arithmetic. So let me remind you what these theorems are. Okay, so we'll denote by C Z of sigma the plane Kolmogorov complexity of some string uh, some string sigma relative to the set Z. Okay, and uh, what this is is the length of the shortest uh, Z description of your of your sigma. Okay, so behind the behind the scenes, we fixed a universal uh, machine U, which we think of as computing functions from strings to strings. Okay, and then we think of um, well, tau is a code for sigma. If the universal machine with Oracle Z spits out sigma when you give it tau, okay, then we say that the complexity of sigma uh, um, relative to Z is the length of the shortest uh, sort of such tau. Okay. Right, and then we say that some set X is infinitely often uh, CZ incompressible if there is um, some fixed B so that uh, infinitely often the initial segment of X, the initial segments of X, so for infinitely many M's, the initial segment of X of length M cannot be compressed more than by this uh, sort of constant B Okay, relative to Z. Okay. So your set X is infinitely often CZ incompressible if infinitely often there are basically no good descriptions of the uh, corresponding initial segment of your of your set X. Right. And then the uh, I guess by now a classic theorem about this is that a set X is too random relative to a set Z, if and only if it's infinitely often uh, incompressible, um, CZ incompressible. Okay, and this was done by uh, Nice, Stefan, and Terwein, and um, uh, at least one of the directions was also done by, by Joe Miller. Okay, and then what uh, Andre and I proved was that uh, this equivalence can also be done in RCA naught. So RCA naught proves this equivalence as well. RCA naught proves that for every Z and X, X is too random relative to Z if and only if X is infinitely often CZ incompressible. Okay, and I, again, I think this is a potentially helpful thing for the study of uh, two randomness in second order arithmetic because well, here I've got it all on one slide, what it means to be infinitely often CZ incompressible in terms of, uh, well, basically just in terms of Turing machines, right? Things that you can formalize easily in, in RCA naught. Okay. Uh, wrong direction. Okay, so I don't really wanna say any details about this, but I do want to, Say some things to hopefully convince you that this is not a uh, not a trivial thing to do. Right? This took some this took some some engineering work to to be able to do this in RCA not. Right? Then the idea is, or the, the the problem is that you have to prove this while avoiding using B sigma two. Right? In RCA not, we only have I sigma one, and if you want to. Um, in when you're working with two randomness, right? The uh, the sort of instinct is to get Turing jumps involved, and then you need sort of B sigma two to, uh, or B, then B sigma two starts to uh, creep in to the arguments that you want to make. Okay, so we want to do this uh, using B sigma two. And then since my formalization of uh, two randomness to begin with was in terms of two tests, I want to do everything in terms of two tests instead of um, somehow uh, martin left tests relative to two jumps or things like that. Okay, so as I was saying, right, we have to avoid B sigma two, and then but B sigma two tends to creep into arguments about computations relative to relative to the jump of something. Okay, so 
if you're if you've got some set Z and you just want to talk about Z jump itself, well then that's kind of okay in RCA not or just with I sigma one because uh, well Z jump right this is a sigma one set relative to Z and then if you can make sense of the initial segments of uh, Z jump because RCA not in the form or the uh, the I sigma one is equivalent to the so-called uh, bounded sigma zero one comprehension scheme. And that can give you uh, arbitrary initial segments of a, uh, of a sigma one set. Okay, So you can make reasonably good sense of, uh, of Z jump at least, right? Just in, just in RCA naught. Um, the problem is if you wanna make sense of uh, something that Z jump uh, computes, right? If you wanna make sense of an arbitrary uh, delta two relative to Z sets, Okay, then you have the danger of wanting, say, the an, an initial segment of an arbitrary delta two relative to z set, right? And getting that to something that's equivalent to b sigma two. Okay, so there's uh, so this is the sense in which there's some danger of you wanting to use uh, um, b sigma two when reasoning about the computations relative to the jump of something. Okay, and the original proofs of um, this two randomness implies infinitely often incompressibility results um, all work with the jump in some way, right? They think of, uh, they use uh, the prefix free complexity relative to, uh, relative to the jump, or they use um, the Martin Loaf randomness relative to, the, relative to the jump, and we want to avoid all that. Okay. So, our proof uh, follows along one given by uh, Bowens, which itself is based on uh, one by Bienvenu, uh, Mushnik Shen, and Vereshagen, and the uh, <clears throat> who uh, sort of uh, proved uh, proved not just they didn't do this just to reprove this uh, this fact, but they were using it to uh, do other things. But they were able to give uh, uh, more proofs of this. Um, to randomness implies infinitely often incompressibility result along the way. Um, but the, the heart of all of these arguments is this uh, covering result due to uh, kinitis. And what this says is I've, if I've got um, a bunch of uniformly ZRE sets where each one uh, has at most measure Q, okay, then what I can do is that if I've got some if I've got uh, any 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 bigger rational p than q, then I can find a now z jump re set uh, v that has measure at most p, and also has this property that um, for every sort of tail of the intersections of these uh, open sets u, right, it's contained in my in my uh, in my v. Okay. Okay. So. The idea here is to capture all the tails of these intersections U, right, with this open set of V that has a little bit worse measure and is also less effective, right? The, the original U's were uniformly ZRE, but the V here is Z, Z prime RE. Okay, and the, and the, what this is used for is that if you've got the some set X um, that's not infinitely often CZ incompressible. Then you use this lemma to try to build a two test that uh, that captures the captures the x. Okay, so this is a lemma of uh, Canidas, but again, this is using things relative to to Z jump, and we want to avoid that. Okay, so we get, so we're able to sort of replicate this in in RCA not right where you're avoiding um, <clears throat> where you're avoiding avoiding using Z jump and you sort of, instead of uh, building your class V as, a, as an open set relative to Z jump, right? We can build straight away um, it as a Sigma two class, right? Coded by these uh, um, sequences of trees in the way, way I was um, originally describing. Okay. Okay, so so to do this, right, what you have to do, or the idea is that, well, I've got this um, uh, sort of union of these uh, intersections of the tails of these of these U's, okay? And what I wanna do is somehow 
cut off this, these intersections after, after some point to get a simpler set, right? I want to compute these sort of bounds B such that if I have my V be the union of now these sort of finite intersections of the U's, I get the, uh, I get the sort of covering that I want and also the measure of the V isn't so big. Okay, so you've got to somehow figure out these Bs, right? The Z jump can compute the Bs, but we can't use Z jump. Okay, so the idea is that we have to sort of arrange for this to happen uh, otherwise. Okay, so that's all I really wanted to, to say about that. And the, uh, yeah, I guess um, back to some, yeah, slide here about this. Um, yeah, again, yeah, the reason again I we wanted to do this was that uh, well, first of all, it's hopefully useful for people studying two randomness because it's um, somehow a less heavy formalism of two randomness in in second order arithmetic. Okay, and also carrying this out isn't entirely straightforward because they have to avoid trying to use B sigma two when when carrying out this proof. Yeah, so it took quite a bit of engineering to to set this up. Okay. Okay. So lastly, I want to talk about um, a few more randomness notions. So uh, sort of fortuitously, this was something that uh, Laurent was talking a bit about earlier today. Um, so he was talking about Demut randomness. I'm talking about something slightly different here called weak Demut randomness. And the idea is I've got some, some function H, okay, which I'm thinking of as uh, non-decreasing, I guess. And then I've got what's called a, an H weak Demut test relative to some Z. And what this is, is like a Martin Love test, except um, for each component N, for component UN of your test, you can completely throw away all the work you've done and restart from scratch, the enumeration of your UN, right? Which is to say, you can change the index of the uh, machine that's doing the enumerating, H of n many times. Okay, so it's like a Martin Love test, except for uh, for each n, you can change your mind about what actually the nth component of the test is, H n many times. Right, and we say that H uh, x is H weekly Demut random relative to z if it now weekly passes. Every uh, every one of these tests, and um, yeah, I put weekly here just because this is technically the right thing to say, but it's really just the acceptance condition or the passing condition we've been talking about uh, uh, all along. And uh, and the pros say pass to mean something else, and a weak pass to mean uh, not in the intersection, like we've been talking about. Okay, so that's uh, weekly demo. Uh, H weekly Demut random. And lastly, we say that X is balanced random relative to some Z if it passes every um, O2 to the N Demut test relative to Z. Okay, so we can make all of these ideas into randomness notions. Um, so we'll say BR is the statement for every Z. There's an X that's balanced random, where X is balanced random relative to Z. And for H weak Demut random, you have to start with an H that's provably total in RCA not for RCA not to make sense of this idea. But once you've fixed an H like that, then you can say uh, H uh, WDR is the statement. Again, for every Z, there's an X such that X is H weakly Demut random relative to Z. Okay. Um, so there's this like sort of cute fact that um, so formally as randomness notions, right? Balanced randomness is uh, stronger. Every balanced random set is Martin Luff random, but not every Martin Luff random is uh, balanced random. Nevertheless, if you have a Martin Luff random X and you partition it into or where you like uh, slice it into two pieces, X zero and X one, then one of the two pieces has to be balanced random. Okay, and you can carry this idea out in in uh, in RCA not and wind up with um, uh, the fact that as uh, set existence axioms, Martin Love randomness and balanced randomness are are equivalent. 
Okay, and to do this, we have a have a, a more direct proof that of um, of this uh, fact about Martin Loaf random splitting into a uh, one and a half of a Martin Loaf random has to be balanced random than the uh, than the original proof. Okay, so maybe just one more thing, which is. Uh, well, okay, so on the previous slide, we've got that Martin Luff randomness is equivalent to balanced randomness as set existence axioms. Okay, and roughly balanced randomness was this idea of uh, being uh, two to the n weekly demut random, right? Which is to say, in your Martin Luff test, you can change the identity of the nth component two to the n many times. Okay, so this sort of begs the question of. Uh, well, sort of MLR can do the, to, can do weak demuth randomness for at least this rate, right? Can it do can it do more? How fast does the does the H have to grow before um, before MLR can't prove HWDR anymore? Right. And what we showed that is that if your H grows faster than or if your if your H dominates the uh, k to the n function for every k, then indeed H weak demuth uh, randomness is stronger than than MLR. Right and well, equivalently stronger than BR, as as uh, set existence axioms. Okay, so that's the last thing here. So if I've got some H that uh, RCA proves is total, right? Just so the statement HWDR makes sense, and H dominates all of these k to the n functions, then then MLR can't prove HWDR. Right. In fact, weak kerning's lemma can't even do this. Okay, so and then uh, to 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 get the model here, what you can do is build a model of weak Kerning's lemma, where every set in the model is k to the n r e for some k, right, depending on x, and then that'll do it, right? Because if uh, h eventually dominates k to the n, then no k to the n r e set can be h uh, h weakly demut random. Okay, so that was that's the strategy for uh, for this one. All right, thank you very much. That's all I have today. All right, well, let's each thank uh, Paul in our own way. Um,